my name is uh, dr harish khare and i am honored you have been asked to moderate this session on the top topic of reconceptualizing india's political economy we have a distinguished panel but let me say a few words about myself i was once a card carrying member of the academic profession but now for over many decades four decades in fact i am content to enjoy the thrills and excitement of working in the world of media as a political journalist and commentator i have been engaged with the ever changing landscape of political economy which is our topic for the day we have three panelists professor john harris professor arun kumar and we have uh, uh, sita rameshwari i hope he'll be joining us um i can't see his face but i'm sure he's there mm. so uh, i'll talk about uh, each panelist in the, when we come to them individually but let me say a few words about our topic and the subject matter i think all politics is all about who gets what at whose expense this is a whole formulation attributed to professor harrell last well and the world of political economy seeks to explore the nature of who controls and commands and perhaps commandeer the state the indian state uh, has been bordered in boxed in by a constitutional arrangement uh, and the conventional analysis has uh, tried to examine the nature of control the nature of who controls the state within the parameters of the indian constitution in my view there are four or five axes around which uh, conventional yeah. uh, struggle over resources collective resources has taken place in india the first axis in my view is the center and the periphery we have a, the indian state is run from new delhi that is the uh, official site of the center and then we have a very large unsettled uh, unintegrated uh often unhappy periphery and that how do we keep managing keeping them within the tent has been one of the perennial issues of political economy the second axis around which issues of political economy have worked themselves is the relationship between the union and the states who is more powerful who is less powerful uh what is the space available to the center what is the union what is the state available to federating unions that has been again a very very unsettled question unsettled equation the third equation in my view is between the state and the citizens the state whether it is represented by the central government 
or by uh, state authorities in provinces and the citizen. The whole range of civil liberties, fundamental rights, privacy, um, uh, how much space and prerogatives and rights citizens enjoy or will be allowed to enjoy, that question is a perennially uh, work in progress. The fourth axis, I believe, has to be between the majority and the minorities in India. The majority, as we know, India is a Hindu majority state uh, country, and then there are very significant minorities. What is the relationship between, and what are the terms of those relationships between the majority and minorities? is also a subject matter of continuous political contention. And lastly, I believe it has to be what is the role of public sector and the private enterprise, private business. So that has again, over the years, has been changing and changing and um, remains uh, mostly unsettled. So we have these, uh, in my view, at least five definitive equations which continue to demand attention from at least the practicing political class. And the name of the games for the earlier few years was accommodation and partnership. Uh, no group or individual or political force felt that they are so dominant that they can dictate terms of submission. But I believe now we have that accommodation and partnership paradigm has come under very, very serious threat. Again, in terms of political economy, I, I think it's important for us to remember that in the first three, four years after the independence, the political class parliamentary democracy, democratic processes, themselves enjoyed a huge legitimacy. There was historical reasons for that. But more important, that legitimacy stemmed from the fact that there was a promise that peaceful democratic processes and institutions enshrined in the constitution was sufficient to produce competence, fairness, and justice. Some of the other that the political class collectively was not able to deliver on that promise. There was, by 1991, consensus was there uh, that the economy had been badly managed, mismanaged, and the whole idea of the state being able to a neutral, be a neutral empire or perhaps a primary driver in producing a social order based on justice, that idea took a beating. I would like to believe that the collapse of the Soviet Union around 1989 also brought into uh, some kind of disrepute the idea of the state being able to uh, deliver on its promises. So by 1991, 
uh, a new thinking, a new argument uh, was put forth that rapid growth, unregulated, unhindered private enterprise would produce sufficient growth and a prosperity and will be able to deal with the issues of poverty and unequal opportunities. That uh, for 20 years, uh, from 1991 onward, I think we, a uh, lot of turmoil took place in Indian politics, political economy uh, was rearranged. And then India, like all other economies or political systems, was not an isolated case. There was a global context to whatever happened. And my view is that when 9-11 happened on September 19, 2001, uh, the Indian middle classes upper and middle middle class the business uh, but outside the United States I think the Indian middle classes were the most affected by the 9-11 watershed. What now we are witnessing is um, Cumulatively, we have all other our equations, five axes we, we talked about earlier. After 9-11, Indian political system went into a turmoil and the uh, primary goals of collective political life, that is fairness, justness, equity, political accountability, all those uh, were put on the back burner and our public discourse got animated. Uh, around issues of national security, security, uh, how, who is going to protect us against non-state actors? And the threat of non-state actors became, it may have produced a certain kind of consequential repercussions in America, but in India it was most most acutely felt in my judgment and we were willing to redefine ourselves our constitutional earlier constitutional commitments and conventions uh, on the basis of in the larger issues of security public order and all that and the state was given more and more power to uh, deal with the threat of undefined threat from undefined sources of undefined nature. The state kept asking for more and more power. The policemen became uh, what a priority was prioritized over the politician. So the source of legitimacy. In India, Indian political economy changed. Earlier it was that the state would be able to deliver uh, uh, certain fairness. Then we brought in the market and its supposed rationality to produce uh, enough affluence and prosperity. And now after 9-11, last 10, 15 years, 20 years, in fact, we have been struggling with this whole question of uh, our 
we we expect our at least our lead our leaders that they will be able to produce welfare maybe but their primary job is that expectation is that they will be able to protect us give us security and stability and we are willing to submit ourselves to anybody any demagogue any authority in personality who promises that he or she will be able to uh, protect our ordered life from these in a hostile world in a from hostile people so this is where we have uh, and i may add that in the last 10 15 years we have a new technocratic elite has come into play uh, which is difficult to um, be identified in terms of his class affiliations but this is a elite which uh, attaches itself to whichever person captures political power um, and it anchors itself in its command and proficiency and competence in using technology to find solutions to administrative issues and it is also it has great disdain for democratic accountability it doesn't want to deal with the messiness of parliamentary electoral democracy recently we have few days ago our um, the ceo of niti ayog uh, uh, allowed himself to say we have too much democracy mm-hmm. so they'll be happy the it's a it's a very nice convergence between this technocratic elite security forces um and a kind of political leadership which uh, is closet authoritarian and it uh, it has choked off uh, uh, disagreement dissent uh, and turned off the um, um, the tap of political accountability in my view so we the political economy actually right now is in is the most in my view the most uh, uh, defining feature of is that they just we india has a lure we are allured with authoritarianism authority in solutions authority in men authority in ideas so this is where i think um, and these people have, um, uh, the political a certain degree of delicious contradictions are there on the one hand political class continues to go through electoral politics which the very nature of competitiveness ensure that the state cannot and is not allowed to abandon its welfareist obligations um and the that electoral success itself provide the legitimacy for exercising state power and there is of course uh, because of electoral politics democratic mobilization political mobilization you we are witnessing a continuous and perhaps a very healthy continu- uh, churning of our social equations which makes um, uh, an electorate of 900 million uh, voters a wonderful uh, playground for all kind of uh, play of social forces so i'll stop there and uh, uh, we'll hear three different views uh, uh, we'll go at the listed order uh, sidaram ji 
are you ready to come in and um, um, uh, sita ramachuri is the uh, general secretary of communist party of india marxist and not only that he is also a very highly respected uh, theoretician and a very effective parliamentarian over the years mm. over to you uh, thank you thank you thank you harish uh, and uh, hello to uh, arun kumar niraj jindok and our stay and to professor harris that we have uh, interacting for the first time thank you very much harish for your opening remarks uh, but uh, i would like to make uh, three i think fundamental points since the issue we are discussing is on reconceptualizing india's political economy now political economy by definition is that the economy should dovetail to the political objectives of the ruling classes at any point of time that's why i have a serious objection uh, harish otherwise i mean i admire most of your writings and analysis to this uh, overall monolithic conception of what is called the political class the politicians are not a class by themselves i mean they are different class interests within the politicians and which is the dominant one which is the ruling one that determines the trajectory of the of the economic policy and the direction now with that in mind what was how did india's political economy evolve and i think this is, this is important because often it is said it is the nehruvian vision that got the public sector etc etc immediate post independence the effort by the indian ruling classes then was for an independent path of capitalist development in india and this is something that was provoked by what is famously known as the bombay plan of the biggest industrialist in our country who actually argued for a planning commission and planning and centralized planning with state raising the resources from the people to build the infrastructural facilities that are necessary for capitalist development your steel factories your i mean the entire works of the public sector the temples of modern india as nehru had defined the objective was to lay the foundations for the development of capitalism in india an independent trajectory and that is why you find these interests of conflicts and at times collaboration with western capital with the uh, you know, I mean finance capital of the world there are contradictions which were there very obviously in the early part of our uh, our independent india and this meant that independent capitalist development meant our economic self reliance and economic sovereignty to be protected and maintained and that is the trajectory that defined in the early decades your planning commission your public sector establishment your then subsequently extended by indira gandhi under of course left pressure again the nationalization of banks the nationalization of coal i mean all this was that the state was laying the foundations for the infrastructural development soon essential for independent capitalist development which no individual capitalist in india then was capable of investing that lot so that was the political economy of that of, of that time but like you pointed out uh, harish that the collapse of the soviet union led to a different type of an impact not merely the collapse of the state and state planning etc that's, that's also important but the other aspect of it was that it it unleashed unleashed neoliberalism in in a, in its animal spirit so to speak there is no countervailing power in the world so let us have a neoliberal project what does neoliberalism mean globalization under the leadership of international finance cap now in finance is what is dictating since 91 onwards more pronouncedly earlier decade also it, it happened but more pronouncedly since 91 onwards is dictating the terms at which this globalization will take place and what does that mean maximizing aven for aven I mean, maximizing avenues for maximizing profits which means privatization 
which means privatization of public utilities, which means privatization of responsibilities, which we earlier thought was state's uh, uh, obligation to the people of health and education, etc. Everything needs to be privatized in order to allow avenues for maximization profits. The 1991 reform process initiated that, but it was not in such an unbridled fashion that there were no forces within the political spectrum that were resisting this. So they had to be a process of checks and balances. And whenever the political situation in the country gave the opportunity for alternate governments to come, much of this was also tempered. This happened in 1996 with the United Front government. This happened subsequently with the UPA government, with these common minimum programs that came. It is not that this could be reversed. We tried, but, but that was not unless the political uh, correlation changes. But nevertheless, it could be tempered. But then subsequently, my third point is that since 2014, what you talked of, Harish, that intolerance, that uh, the, the, what do you call, absolute uh, rejection of being accountable, I mean, all these are part of a larger project. All of us are aware, I mean, we all have been uh, through our Indian uh, history, etc. That the conception of independent India as a secular democratic republic was the legacy of the national movement. And this, this conception is what gave initially the Congress party post-independence post the overall hegemony over civil society. And that hegemony was ruptured. I think very decisively by the 2014 elections, whereby what was rejected at the time of independence that led to the unfortunate assassination of Mahatma Gandhi, the rejection of that Hindu or Hindutva Rashtra, that is something that has resurfaced because it was never completely eliminated from the consciousness of the people. 2014 saw the re-emergence of converting the secular democratic republic into a Hindu Torah. That is what explains the every single pillar of your constitution. Secular democracy, social justice, federalism that you mentioned, center state relations, and economic sovereignty. All four of them have come under a severe assault. And that is necessary because this transformation of India from a secular democratic constitutional republic into a intolerant, fascistic, Hindutva Rashtra cannot be possible with this constitution in place. That's why the attacks on the constitutional institution, beginning with the parliament, and the pressures on the judiciary, the election commission, the ED, the CBI, everything, whatever you may have. So what is happening today is that this agenda requires international support. That international support can only come when you give international finance capital, you give international capital more avenues to maximize profits in India. And that requires the virtual loot of your national assets, the entire dismantling of the public sector, the handing over of all these assets for a song to private capital, both foreign and domestic, which is exactly what is happening today. So the, this agenda economic agenda of the current government today is dovetails into the political objective of transforming a secular democratic republic into their conception of a rapidly intolerant fascistic Hindu Faraj that requires the demolition of the constitution, the, cons the institutions which act as checks and balances, the abolition of your planning commission, the Niti Ayo actually championing the interests of private capital and the maximization of profits. So it's not merely the state abandoning its responsibility. It is the state playing a new role. And that new role is the needs and the dictates for the ruling classes at the present. So this is something we'll have to understand. So when you have to reconceptualize India's political economy, the re my last point, I don't know, Harish, if you please stop me if I'm running our exceeding my time. No. But la uh, last one. If you want to reconceptualize India's political economy, 
what is the reconceptualization in the present context in which we are saying is to return to the concept of what we have all discussed in various ways, the concept of idea of India. What is this idea of India? It's not an abstract idea of India. That this is a country that is inclusive. This is a country that dared in 1950 in front of the whole world when many Western democracies are still not given this right of we gave the right for universal suffrage. We gave the right for equality irrespective of any division in society. Now, when you reconceptualize political economy, that right and justice that you promised in the constitution, economic, social, political, that justice, that has to be brought back to the center stage of the agenda. So political economy, therefore, is not only one economic policy here or there or something of that nature. But it is the entire gamut of the character of the ruling classes at that particular point of time. What is their political objective? To achieve that political objective, what, what is the economic policy that we follow? Yes, the policies that uh, are currently being followed will impoverish more people. They are. Will make more people jobless. They are. Will increase the levels of poverty. They are. But that dis discontent amongst the people does not bother this ruling classes because with one, one incident where they can inflame emotional passions, all this can be put in the back burner and that becomes the dominant issue. The last decade or more, in fact, nearly two decades since Gujarat, 2001, if you look at it, every election had an emotive appeal on the basis of something that happened in the earlier. And so all the real issues go into the background. So reconceptualizing India's political economy means finally is to return back to the basics of defending this constitution, the rights in, inherent in it. And from there will follow the economic policy that we worked out of, of justice that is political, economic, and social for every Indian citizen. That is something that is possible in India. There is no dearth of resources. It's only the question of a policy mix. Even today, let me make my final point, sorry. Even today, if India adopts a sort of a new New Deal, I'm using the term New Deal for what the US did. Massive public investments build our infrastructure. They will generate jobs. And that will lead to an increase in domestic demand. And that will kickstart the economy. But then that is not in the interest of the ruling classes today. That is the point. That is why reconceptualization of political economy means reconceptualizing your politics and the political hegemony in the country. That, that will have to be undertaken. Thank you. Thank you so much for your attention. Asking to put his mic on. Eh? Despite, uh, I, I'll say it again. Uh, uh, thank you, um, Sitaram, for um, uh, a very cogent uh, formulation. But I, we are still struggling with one simple fact that despite massive discontent, why is uh, we are not able to force the ruling classes into do any kind of course correction. So that should that re, not only we when we are looking at reconceptualizing, we probably need to reconceptualize how we uh, go about the business of resistance and struggle and opposition. So may I now request uh, Professor John Harris, who needs no introduction. He's one of the old India hands, have devoted uh, decades and decades to understanding the political economy of India. Um, he, John and Barbara have been great friends of uh, um, in the old tradition of 
you know, in their hands, so to say. Uh, Professor Harris, over to you. Uh, thank you very much indeed for that uh, for that introduction. I hope I'm I'm heard all right. Um, <clears throat> I am going to, um, I suppose I, I really want to address uh, one of the axes of political economy that I think you uh, referred to, Harish, uh, which is to do with the relationships between um, urban India, if you will, uh, and uh, rural uh, society. And I'm very conscious of, of uh, the present context of, uh, as uh, Sitaram uh, said, the present context, uh, not just of jobless growth, but actually of job loss growth, of declining consumption, increasing poverty, trends which uh, actually precede uh, the present uh, time of the pandemic, which has only, uh, only made them uh, worse. And I, I want to address uh, really the question of, of what is, what is to be done? Um, I, I think that perhaps uh, what I shall say will seem even a, little, a little utopian. Um, and I certainly recognize that, uh, that uh, it is perhaps difficult in the present conjuncture to see where the political drivers are that might bring about the changes that I think are, are required. But I think it is necessary to think about, you know, what should be the directions of economic policy in order to approach more, 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 uh, more closely those ideals, objectives of justice, fairness, equity um, that, uh, that you, have, uh, you have referred to. And I really want to sort of think about is there, is there an alternative? What is, what is the alternative uh, for the mass of uh, the people? To the, uh, the mass of the people, a very large proportion of whom remain uh, residents, or at least in terms of primary residents, residents of rural India uh, and dependent on the agrarian economy. At the moment, it seems to me, the trend is that uh, these people, a large proportion of the population of the country, are largely excluded from, uh, from economic opportunity, are largely excluded from the benefits of, of growth, and are increasingly uh, sort of uh, dependent on such welfare uh, as the state provides. The sort of welfareism Polish, that you uh, that you referred to uh, in your introductory uh, remarks. So, you know, is there an alternative? Uh, or what not might be the alternative uh, to this present uh, state uh, state of affairs? <clears throat> uh, I think it is now extremely unlikely uh, that India can follow the path of the successful. Uh, East Asian e economies, uh, which depended upon labor intensive manufacturing uh, for export, uh, increasingly climbing up uh, the value and productivity uh, ladder um, and uh, bringing about both high levels of economic growth and also reasonable uh, distribution of the benefits of growth uh, across the economy. And I think this path. Uh, has been closed uh, for India. Um, it's partly because others, notably China, of course, uh, have got there first. And we're now in a, a period in which there are uh, strong tendencies towards, uh, towards protectionism uh, in the major economies, uh, a distrust uh, of globalized uh, supply chains, um, uh, and uh, uh, then on, as far as India is concerned, of course, uh, we have the disposition uh, of the present regime uh, towards uh, 
self-reliance, um, uh, all the ambiguities of the way in which the Prime Minister uh, talks about, uh, about self-reliance. India's economic development, uh, of course, has been characterized really throughout by uh, dualism. There has for a, a long time been a, a small and uh, very largely inefficient modern organized sector, as you all well know, employing a very small share of the labor force alongside a very large uh, informal sector uh, and the continuation of the situation in which a very large share uh, of the labor force uh, is to a greater or lesser extent dependent uh, upon uh, the uh, agricultural economy. And India's uh, successful, very successful economic growth in the period, what, between about uh, 2002 and 2012, uh, especially, depended mainly uh, on the uh, information, the country's success in uh, the information technology uh, sector, uh, which stimulated uh, the growth of uh, the growth of a, of, of a middle class. But I think we have to remember that those who think of themselves as middle class, who describe themselves as middle class, who are thought of as middle class, actually come from what the top, at best, the top 10% um, of those, uh, the, the top 10% of uh, income distribution uh, in the country. The average incomes in the top 10% are only three or four times at the level of the, of the poverty line. So though the top 10% of the population is a hell of a lot of, hell of, a lot of people, there's not actually a, 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 a very high level uh, of income across that top 10% uh, as, a, as a whole. And this, I think, is a, a, a very crucial indication um, of the uh, of what it seems to me has been the the long history of the problem uh, of uh, the lack of uh, demand, a lack of effective demand uh, in the in the economy. So India now, it's, I think, is well described as being characterized by the very clear distinction between, if you will, a dollar economy and a rupee economy. Um, no, I'm sort of struck as a fairly frequent visitor until the pandemic anyway, uh, to the country that, you know, um, in the, the shopping malls, in the, in the big cities, uh, you know, I pay just about as much for a cup of coffee uh, as, I, as I do in Toronto or, or London, you know? Um, pay as much for a shirt. Uh, as I do in uh, Toronto or London. But the mass of the people live in the rupee economy. And I know perfectly well uh, I can buy an excellent cup of coffee, certainly if I'm in South India, um, uh, or a very good meal uh, for a very, very small sum of, of money in, in dollar terms. And there's very little kind of connection between the rupee economy uh, and the uh, and the dollar e economy. Um, so I I sort of come back really to the long-standing and crucial problem, as it seems to me, uh, of demand uh, in the in the Indian economy. Um, you know, if uh, think about it, if uh, a, a capitalist, an investor, is thinking of of setting up a factory to produce something or other, or uh, a company which is producing services of, uh, of, of some kind, you know, one of the crucial questions they are going to address is that of what's the market? And uh, how, how extensive is, uh, is uh, the, the market? And there's a limit to uh, the, the extent to which that sort of top 10% of the population of, of India uh, can generate demand for higher value 
uh, higher value products. So I think it remains the case that in order to generate higher levels of demand in the economy, there's a desperate need, I think, to raise the incomes of the bottom 50%, the bottom 50%, especially uh, in, the, in the, rural, the rural economy. And I think we know very well that if it's possible to raise the incomes of those in that bottom 50%, stimulate demand for the products of low skill, um, local uh, activity in manufacturing and services, and that it is possible through the links between, uh, yeah, the, the, the links between uh, agriculture uh, and non-agricultural activity to get, uh, a, 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 if you will, a virtuous spiral of growth. Increasing agricultural incomes increases, uh, increases the demand for, as I say, low skill, uh, both manufactured and service products um, of uh, low skill activity. We get a virtuous spiral of growth. So, I mean, the, the, the crucial point that I really want to make is that I think there remains, even now, a very strong case uh, for uh, a strategy of realizing economic growth through a, a focus on agriculture, uh, which has been very seriously neglected um, for a, a long time now. Um, so how to develop the, uh, the agricultural economy? Quite clearly, there needs to be a big push for diversification uh, to produce more higher value products, horticultural products, poultry, dairy, you know, heavens, even actually wine. Um, uh, for the development, uh, for such diversification to take place, there's a, a great need for investment uh, in infrastructure, uh, in sort of investment that it is necessary to develop the supply chains uh, for the sorts of higher value products uh, that I am talking about. I think there remains a case, even now, for uh, redistribution of, of land, even though there's much less land to be redistributed now, uh, than was the case uh, in the middle of the, the 20th century. But there remains a case for some redistribution of land. I think there's an important need to develop farmer producer organizations, uh, different forms of, of uh, farmer cooperatives, uh, so that farmers come together uh, to, to, uh, to engage um, with, uh, with agribusiness uh, in the marketing of their, uh, of, of, their, of their products. Tremendous need, I think, for, on the one hand, uh, the, develop, the application and development of science and technology in relation to agriculture, uh, to recognize and to develop the potentials, for example, in gene editing, which must not be uh, confused with gene, uh, with genetic uh, uh, modification. And then a lot of effort, if you will, to develop sort of low-tech solutions uh, to the improvement of agricultural productivity uh, as well. Now, I mean, I, 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 I know this all must all sound like kind of pie in the sky, given the present dispensation um, uh, and the dominance of that uh, uh, Sitaram Yachuri was uh, was talking about of uh, particular um, pol political class, if uh, if you will. But I think we have to think about um, you know what needs to be done um, in order to bring about a different a different pattern of uh, of economic growth uh, in the country 
the pattern of economic growth which actually will deliver uh, improved uh, standards of, of living for uh, the great majority of, of people in the country so that they are not actually excluded as they are very substantially at the moment and left, as I say, rather dependent upon uh, the kind of welfare that uh, the, state, the state provides uh, and the provision of which uh, helps to provide legitimacy for the authoritarian uh, regime uh, which uh, we have in place at, at the moment. Thank you. It's mm -hmm. my two bits worth. Well, I think um, you have come very close to the bone, Professor Harris. Uh, but again, uh, the question would remain, and we have to... Um, what are the drivers? Where, where would that come from? <laughs> where would that come from? Yes. <laughs> uh, so, um, given, the, uh, given the spread of political actors, political forces, um, uh, with different social uh, and economic clout, that is something which uh, something which remains uh, uh, a very elusive thing to us. Yeah. Now, um, uh, I move on to our third panelist for this afternoon, Professor Arun Kumar, a very old friend of mine, and uh, one of the very first. Uh, economist in India to draw our attention to what uh, the whole question of black money, parallel economy, and what uh, uh, unhealthy consequences it has for um, our collective well being. Arun is uh, recently retired from. The new teaching is a wonderful teacher by all accounts and has been a, is now educating public at large through his columns and public comments. Arun, over to you. Uh, thank you, Harish. Thank you for that uh, introduction. Yes, we've been friends going back to 1980. Yeah. Uh, thanks for inviting me. Thanks to the organizers. And I have a slight PPT, so I'll share that. Uh, can you see the PPT? Can you see the slides? Yep, yeah, yeah, we can see now. Okay. So what I'll be doing is presenting, you know, a sort of historical perspective on the political economy and its development and how it's been very contentious and it has shackled progress in the economy. Now, the first slide is, you know, how do we define political economy? And basically what I'm going to argue is that it's a field of social sciences that studies the interrelationships between economic interests and political forces in society something that Harish alluded to. Uh, it determines government policies and drives the social dynamics, which is what I think Sitaram uh, mentioned. Uh, political forces typically define their interests as society's interests. And often what they understand to be their current interest becomes their national interest. So in a sense, there's an involvement of hegemony of ideas uh, uh, you know, in society, which comes from the ruling classes. Uh, these interests, of course, are not static. They change with time and so does the politics and the policies that are associated with it. And you know, one prime example of that is how the international finance capital has been changing its policies since 1960s. You know, during the time of Vietnam War, you know, when McNamara became the president of the World Bank, he defined, you know, poverty rule as the key goal. But after the Vietnam War, the goal became the Brazilian model and so on and so forth. So it depended on what the current interest of the international finance capital was. So the dominant political interests present their own interests as the good of society, and that's what the hegemony is all about. Uh, these interests may be couched very differently in a democracy or in an autocracy. You know, they're not the same. So how you present it to society changes as the nature of uh, the regime changes. Now, to understand the current situation in India, it is necessary to situate it in the global context. So the global context is one which shifted in the Indian context and the global context in the 1970s. So the strategic shift that takes place is the decline of Soviet Union, which Sitaram mentioned. And also I would add to that the changes in China where Deng Xiaoping came in and he said, how did the color of a cat matter? 
whether it's black or white, it just has to catch mice. Uh, so the developing world lost its relative independence to formulate policies post that mid 70s change that took place. Uh, how did that happen? The World Bank and IMF, along with other institutions, became a part of the Washington consensus, and that gained greater grip over national policies in the name of globalization. So you have a, a one size fit all that is prescribed for nations. You know what they need to do is to do marketization. The WTO also came into being in 1995, and the move towards WTO was started in 1982 when uh, the US realized that India doesn't have support from the Soviet Union and Soviet Union cannot give help. So it said to uh, the Indian ambassador at uh, GATT, what was then GATT, that, you know, we now want to capture agriculture markets. Uh, so the Dunkel draft came in 1990. And before that, in the Uruguay round of negotiations, we had the new issues introduced and they finally became the WTO in 1995. Now, as a result of these changes, what happened was that capital gained mobility. So capital became highly mobile. The movement of capital is, you know, 10 to 20 times greater than the actual uh, trade and much, much greater than what the GDP of the world is. And with this mobility, what the uh, capital could do, international finance capital is, it made nations compete against each other. And therefore, it could extract concessions. So if uh, South Korea had 10% uh, capital gains tax, then India also had to offer 10% capital gains tax. If the corporate tax rate in Southeast Asia are lower, then in 2019, India also lowered the uh, tax rates, uh, the corporate tax rates. Uh, this really started with the collapse of Soviet Union when East uh, Europe needed capital. And then to uh, get capital, it started cutting the tax rates. And that is what's called the race to the bottom. And then, you know, Britain, uh, uh, Germany, France, etc., also had to cut. Uh, their tax rates and that led to the decline of the public sector because you know public uh, services could not be funded uh, one of the key concessions that has been extracted by capital is to weaken labor so trade unions have actually declined uh, in that period uh, since then so what are the other global uh, strategic shifts one of the critical shifts was that the state should retreat strategically it doesn't mean that the state should retreat completely from the economy it only means that it should retreat in favor of the markets so what the World Bank defined as a market-friendly state intervention. So there needs to be state intervention, but in favor of markets, but not in favor of labor. So subsidies and other things are frowned upon because those are supposed to be uh, pro-labor and anti-capital. Another thing that happened in this period is rapid technolog technological change, which has further weakened labor because of the massive automation and what John mentioned as the jobless growth, uh, and which now has become uh, less job uh, growth. Uh, services sector became the dominant sector in most economies in the world, including in India. After 1979, the services sector has dominated. Agriculture, which was the earlier dominant sector, became a marginal sector. And you can see that, that after 1979, even if the uh, agriculture goes into a drought and there's a decline, the Indian economy doesn't have a negative rate of growth as it used to have earlier. So it continues to have a positive rate of growth because the services sector is uh, dominating. And with the growth of the services sector, the white collar workers, uh, you know, they have started to dominate and they don't identify with the blue collar workers. And as a result, there's a labor aristocracy that has come in the way of workers unity across and within nations. So global financial architecture has come to prevail, which has led to flight of capital from developing world to the developed world. Uh, there's a very famous book uh, which shows that how uh, with the end of uh, colonization, the advanced nations set up you know these uh, tax havens and there are 90 of these tax havens through which capital goes into the uh, developed world so what was coming earlier as uh, you know drain of wealth is now going to the advanced countries as flight of capital so poor countries are exporting capital so india a very poor country has lost the you know value of about 2 trillion dollars of uh, capital between 1948 and 2012 according to an estimate that i made in 2014 now, what is the Indian situation? Uh, Indian economic policies increasingly came under pressure of international finance capital after 1975, and that coincides with the emergency, that coincides with the changes, uh, with the weakening of Soviet Union, and with the 180 degree turn that was there in uh, uh, China. And as a result, policies have drifted right. What was center became right, what was left of center became center, and you can see the whole gamut of social, political, and economic policies that shifted to the right. Now, as a result, what has happened is that the Indian economy 
which has come to be dominated by the services sector and agriculture has got marginalized. So even though agriculture em employs the majority of the workers, it's a marginalized uh, sector in the economy. And how did that happen? Right from the time of independence, the income terms of trade have shifted from agriculture to non-agriculture. And the reason is that the surplus which was extracted from agriculture to the non-agriculture sector provided for cheap industrialization and urbanization. And that's why you know the political forces that have existed in India have allowed this kind of extraction of surplus for industrialization and urbanization. Uh, investment has got concentrated in the organized sectors and in urban areas to the detriment of rural areas, which is what I think John was referring to. Uh, you know, a study that I did in 2008 showed that 80% of all investment is going into the organized sector, where only 6% of the workforce works. Whereas in agriculture, where you still have 45% uh, of the workforce, only 5% of the investment is going. So in, in a sense, there's a marginalization of the rural areas and of agriculture in policy making. So this is what is leading to a marginalizing growth. The unorganized sector, which is 94% of the workforce and produces 45% of the output, that has got marginalized. You know, uh, there, you know, the, the output and the incomes uh, both have gone down uh, relative to the other sectors. So employment generation is weakened as a result of lack of demand, which is what uh, John was pointing to. And that is forcing people to look for residual employment in the unorganized sector. So unorganized sector is not the one which is generating jobs like the formal sector is supposed to do. But here, because in India, you don't have you know, uh, 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 unemployment door. So as soon as you lo lose work, you have to go and create a job for yourself. You do head load work. You put a, or push a rickshaw or something. Uh, so this becomes a sector of last resort for the vast majority of the Indians. And therefore, the unorganized sector has been acting as a reserve army of labor, trying to keep the wages down in the economy. Because you know, uh, even the organized sector workers are afraid that they would, if they lose their employment in the organized sector, they would actually become you know very poor. So bulk of the Indian workers do not get a living wage, and that therefore they are not able to cope with the crisis. And that's the lesson of the pandemic, where we saw millions upon millions migrating from <coughs> urban areas to rural areas. And surveys showed that 90% said they don't have enough savings even to buy one week of supplies. And that's why as soon as income stopped, they started starving. So therefore, a result is that there are large contradictions in the Indian economy. We have the fourth largest number of billionaires, but also the largest number of poor, especially after the pandemic, and also the largest number of illiterate uh, people in the country. Now, 22% may be below the extreme poverty line, but my argument is that at least 70% are poor, something that I think John was alluding to. And the example can be taken from the Delhi Socioeconomic Survey of 2018. There it was shown that 90% of the families spend less than 25,000 rupees per month. Now, Delhi's uh, per capita income is two and a half times the national per capita income. That means if you uh, think about the poorest states, then 90% families there are spending less than 10,000 rupees, which means they remain very poor. Now, the black economy has increased dramatically, and that has led to the further increase in inequality. Because what was 4% of GDP in 1955 as per Caldor's uh, estimate, by, 19, by uh, 2012, it had become 62%. And bulk of it is concentrated in the hands of 3%. So that if you look at the income disparities, including the black economy, they're far higher than what they would be otherwise in the white economy. And that's what leading to problems. So <laughs> all this is a consequence of the top-down top approach that we've uh, followed in the country. Uh, the top-down approach uh, starting in 1947 was at least moderated by the idea that the state would intervene and they would do, give welfare. But post-1991, even the welfare came down because the budgetary expenditures on education, health, etc. were all curtailed. So Indian capitalists accepted to be a junior partner of the international finance capital post-1991. And what Sitaram was talking about, the independent path of development, that was more or less given up. Uh, we also need to focus on the research and development because that's where India has lagged behind in globalization. And as a result, you know, India's exports have not been very competitive and we've had a very large trade account deficit in the uh, economy, which weakens India. Now, it is said that, you know, uh, st late start gives you an advantage, but I have been arguing that because we did not have enough R&D, uh, disadvantage of a late start hit us. And that's why we've been uh, behind in terms of technology development. Uh, so the massive growth of inequalities and crisis that has uh, resulted since 1947 
because of this top-down approach has actually uh, been very important if we want to understand the political economy of India. A large population is there, but as uh, John was saying, the demand is very small because if the uh, bulk of the people are earning less than 10,000 rupees uh, uh, per month per family uh, and spending only 10,000 rupees per month per family, then of course the demand would be weak and the growth would slow down. Now, data is manipulated to a very large extent, what we see. So the spurts of growth have come when investment is spurted, like between 2001 and 2008-9, or when exports have surged. But recently, we've seen for eight quarters before the pandemic, the official data declined from 8% quarterly growth rate to 3.1%. But this data does not include the unorganized sector independently, except for agriculture. If you include the unorganized sector, then the rate of growth is much less than what the official figures uh, uh, suggest. So I've been arguing that the economy had already entered recession before the pandemic came. This has also invisibilized the unorganized sector and the women uh, in the workforce whose uh, participation in the workforce has been declining. Uh, policies post-1991 uh, were known to be marginalizing policy, and that's why the World Bank was talking of the safety net, because it realized that large number of poor people would fall below you know, the poverty line. So that's why we went in for right to food, education, rural employment, midday meal in the mid 2000s decade. But that's not a solution to the problem that only mitigates to a certain extent the problem. But that doesn't solve the problem as far as the poor and the marginalized are concerned. So to conclude, the consequences are because of a very weak democracy. The mainstream parties represent the vested interest. And in this sense, there's a consensus amongst them. A vast majority have little choice between various candidates. And therefore, people vote for the corrupt uh, from different parties. Uh, you have, you know, all, all parties that are there, the ruling parties, they have, you know, been sh uh, shown to be uh, part of the corruption that exists. Uh, big business dominates policy making and the political process. And currently now, the government is trying to build huge monopolies, you know, whether it be the big business houses dominating ports or airports or others. I think they have decided to follow the South Korean model of chai balls. Uh, so that you have big con conglomerates and all policies uh, you know focused on that you know uh, so uh, this monetization of assets and other things are also so that you know a lot of assets can be passed on to the big uh, monopolies that can be created so capitalism has increasingly become cronyism and th that has led to concentration of economic power and that is what is the, pro the problem but the focus is not on technology because you can get uh, get assets easily if you can get assets easily then you don't have to compete in technology terms. And that's why India has lagged behind in R&D and therefore lagged behind in terms of globalization. Uh, elections are very expensive, and that's where the big money begins to dominate uh, our political class. Uh, and that, therefore, the political economy has shifted uh, over a period of time as elections have become more and more expensive. Consumerism has become the new opium of the masses, and that ma helps to marginalize the issues of the people. Vested interests begin to dominate, and that's why academics and activists matter less and less. One of the points that the organizers uh, had asked us to comment on, but I think we matter far less than what we did earlier. Uh, we are headed towards a new normal post the pandemic. There's going to be a lot more automation. We are already seeing the growth of e-commerce and the you know unemployment. The demand for rural employment guarantee scheme has shot up. You know, and I don't think you know the employment would be generated in the way it was even before the pandemic, even though employment generation was a problem. So therefore, the marginalizing development that has been taking place, we need to rethink because this uh, strategy of concentration and growing concentration in the economy is going to lead to a pr uh, pro problem and a crisis. So business has to take a long-term view of the Indian pol political economy in its own interest. Otherwise, its own growth would be affected. Just like before the pandemic, the rate of growth had dropped from 8% to 3.1% quarter on quarter. And therefore, what you uh, uh, want to do is re-look at the development paradigm that we've been following and that would be in, in the interest of the business class itself but whether it would do that or not is not very clear also i think the middle classes would not like uh, a, a re-look at the development paradigm because they've benefited from it they wouldn't want to lose their uh, gains from it even though the large number of middle classes have suffered due to the pandemic and also if automation takes place they are going to suffer further so if we are to uh, be a contention uh, in contention in a globalizing world, we need to really relook at the development paradigm. Thanks for your patience.
Thank you, Arun. Uh, that was a very, very um, disquieting presentation, I may say so. Uh, um, a million dollar question again. Do we have any experiences of any big business or cap big capitalism uh, uh, trimming its own appetite, uh, becoming a little more responsible than before? Why would Indian businesses uh, now they uh, they have tasted blood, so to say? Uh, unmitigated uh, uh, sway over uh, state and its resources. Um, and the only countervailing forces would be democratic mobilization from below. So we are, and that as we have discovered and talked about, uh, that remains one of our major, major weaknesses in the present situation. Uh, Neera, do you want to say something? Okay. So, um, John, do you have anything to um, uh, carry forward this conversation? What you heard, which? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, uh, I as you said, uh, Harish, I think that uh, Arun's uh, presentation uh, ended very much on a on a pessimistic a very pessimistic note and if i sort of think back to you know what i was saying uh, i suppose i do rather if i accept uh, arun's argument and i think it's a very powerful one then i think i do see the the, the future for the mass of the people it is to be largely excluded um marginalized and left very dependent upon uh, upon such welfare benefits as the state provides, and as I said, that it, to the extent that the, the state does that, it actually uh, uh, legitimates the, uh, the the regime. I wonder, uh, though, still if it might not be over mobilizations around economic and social rights that we can see. The possibility of the the development or the, or the redevelopment uh, of a, a, a democratic uh, movement from uh, from below, um, and you know, I really wonder uh, if I may ask you, Sitaram, uh, how you see uh, the sort of re the the, the renaissance, the the rebuilding uh, of democratic popular democratic movements. Uh, from uh, from 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 below, um, as I say, I wonder whether it isn't going to be, in the end, actually around struggles for economic and social rights um, that uh, that mobilisation uh, can be uh, can be rebuilt. But over to you, if I may. <laughs> With your permission, Harish? Yes, of course, please. <laughs> well, you're right, absolutely right, uh, John. I mean, in the sense that that is the only way. I mean, as I share the pessimism of Arun and I think many of the issues that he raised, I mean, they're on the common wavelength on that. But that has to change. And the forces that can determinedly change it are the people in struggles. Now, there is, what is happening today, if you notice, 10 months, the Kisans, lakhs of them, are in the path of struggle. You saw that incident that happened the day before yesterday in uh, Lakhimpur Kheri, and you saw the response to it and the reaction, and the government had to actually actually succumb to their, and accept their demands, and, and uh, which is a big, big thing, is that you have forced the UP government, of all governments, the UP government to accept this, now the struggle is on to get rid of that uh, union minister, etc. That is that is what I said. But the point is from below. It takes me back to 105 years ago when Gandhiji introduced the concept of Satyagraha in Champaran. That is exactly the sort of a situation that is building up here. 
you have the the peasantry and the kisan being alienated from their own produce and this sustained struggle none of us thought that this will sustain for this long 700 people have died in the struggle so far but this is the process through which the renaissance that you talked of uh, will have to the beginnings of that is through this process you've seen now big actions that are going on in the trade union front october 7th they've given a call for an all india protest action against this privatization and this monetization pipeline you know on, on all these issues and what is most important from my point of view a new feature that is developing is the actually unity in action between the farmers the trade unionists and the agriculture labor and this is coming into joint actions that that they are calling on I mean, often agreed issues now this is what will be the will be the game changer eventually and will force the political class will force the political class to use a harish's term or the, or the politician to actually move in the direction of restoring what i said earlier restoring the 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 inviolability of the concept of the idea of india of an inclusive india with equal rights now this is the process that has to be studied but then as i indicated when i in my initial opening remarks that whenever such a thing happens there is always one issue that this brought about or happens that uh, I mean, that creates an emotional appeal that pushes everything into the background before the 2014 elections from 2012 onwards for two years there have been the sustained struggles of the working people working classes your scheme workers your massive uh, actions and movement and then you have the pulwama the balakot and then an emotionally charged communal nationalist jingoism and through that i mean you have completely hijacked the popular discontent into emotional channels momentarily maybe i believe momentarily but that is the moment when elections happen and that is that is the issue that we will have all have to actually tackle how this is uh, this could happen when uh, narendra modi became the chief minister of uh, gujarat and the elections to follow you had the gojra incident when vajpayee government fell by one vote and when the elections had to be uh, organized you had the kargil and now you have the uh, pulwama and balakot so this changed the narrative completely and that is that is the something that we we as a uh, 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 as political parties will have to think about how how effectively will we be able to counter this thing. and the other uh, point if i may take this opportunity arish to answer what you said of the question of why is the opposition parties not coming together or what is it that's stopping them well that is a big problem i mean some of us are trying to bring them together we have brought them on many issues till uh, i mean the last one was when this 20 parties came out on on common issues etc and big actions took place in the la last 10 days of september i mean th that has been going on but the question is and i firmly believe as much as i share arun's pessimism about the economy and the poor people i also have that optimism that it is those people who will force the alternative to emerge you remember all of us were there we all fought the emergency what was the alternative there you had a movement yes you had the jp movement the political alternative the janta party that formed the government was formed after the elections the united front that formed the government when vajpay did not have a majority lost the vote of confidence was formed after the election the upa in 2014 was again formed after the elections it is the people's pressure that will push these parties to come together and not be on petty squabbles of whether this issue or that issue no i think i think that process is happening because what we are not are not uh, taking into account is there is a ground swell of an opinion that is building up on the question of the obc bill obc issue now that is going to be an important element in the in the future politics of bringing these parties together and giving an alternative 
and that is happening in the very very heartland the the cobble so to speak where the bjp dominates now that is a, a factor that will be very important for the future for this sort of a political alignment so john finally i mean i think there's no other way for india's renaissance so to speak to return back no. to to the basics so to the constitution unless unless people's struggles are intensified but and, Sidera, may I, if i may add something here yeah i mean it is I think it's not as much an issue of opposition unity. It is the nature of politics we do. I mean, if we keep in mind that, you know, Hindutva agenda is not a new thing. It confronted us from the very beginning of our republic. Yeah. Yet a certain kind of politics was able to beat back uh, those forces. And repeatedly they have been coming and we've been beating them back. So it's a somewhere man, the, the nature of our response to Hindutva, it is it is still beyond the electoral um, yes. adjustments and uh, in, in terms of new ideas how do we deal with uh, what you and i will readily agree is the appeal emotionalism but emotionalism is a fact how do we deal with it um, um but emotionalism was always um, there. Why it is now more pronounced than earlier? And uh, we have to be smarter, uh, as smart in our tactics, in our um, adaptation of technology, in terms of our um, you know intellectual marshalling of intellectual resources and organizational uh, assets. And then the, um, it's not just um, uh, five. Yeah parties coming together yeah, and think, uh, dividing the uh, the booty of the seats i understand but harish there's one point there uh, i mean which i want to really make you see this emotionalism was always there you're right but always we have been able to tackle it when there was a political atmosphere emotionalism and depoliticization when they go together that is when the difficulties arise, and that is precisely what these forces are aiming to depoliticize the people in society. You mentioned, I think Arun mentioned about the role of money in election becoming expensive, etc. No, no, what is that process? I mean, you have reduced elections not to policies, principles, etc. The general saying is whoever may win the election, the BJP will form the government. They did that in Goa, they did it in Karnataka, they did it in Madhya Pradesh. I mean, you know, all that. So if, if you have that sort of a situation where these, this is a lethal cocktail, depoliticization of people, along with rousing of emotional jingoism. Now that is what we have to tackle. You're right. We have to get back onto the agenda, center of the core agenda, people's issues. It is not the so-called post-truth society where emotional appeals and the leader uh, matter more than the actual reality. If finally, I may have one uh, one comment, uh, Arish, mm, with your permission. Sure. You see, there's a very interesting, very old, but very interesting study, which I think we all should uh, reread it. <laughs> it's very revealing today. Is George Lukács' uh, book on the destruction of reason. Now, he started writing this when Hitler was in power. And he started a question that, uh, that plagued him then. And the question that plagues all of us, it's implicit in what you asked now also, is that why is it that the German people nourished under the legacy of the most rational scientific philosophy, whether from Hegel's or to Marx or to everybody else, how did this German people going through that education, through that legacy, internalize and accept the ideology of Hitler and Nazi, Nazism? The single important factor is the destruction of rationality in public discourse, is the destruction of reason. Destroy rationality and replace it with irrationality, which is exactly what I mean today that is happening. Destroy reason and replace it by unreason. Then it's blind faith. Then it's the leader. Then the emotional appeal is the paramount thing. So why we are not able to tackle with that emotional appeal now like we tackled earlier, is in this atmosphere of depoliticization and destroying any rational and reason 
based discourse. Thank you, Shikram. I, I will now give one minute each to Arun Kumar and uh, John before we run out of time. Uh, Arun, please come in. Yeah. Time, so so I, I wanted to take it a little further from what Sitaram is saying. I think the fact that, you know, the downtrodden in the country have been losing out since independence, the gains have been cornered, has also meant that the legitimacy of the state in their minds has come down. They're open to the kind of, you know, the reasoning that has been coming out, the emotionalism that is coming out. Also, the kind of education that we've had, where large number of children in the rural schools, in the fifth standards, are not able to read second class textbook, etc. You know, they have no hope of the future. It's education which can give hope of the future. And they have joblessness, so the hope is reduced. And that's why they hark back and they're open to all kinds of irrational ideas. So I think we need to focus a lot more on education, the kind of education that we are giving. We need to focus on the public services a lot more. And finally, I would say that when the crisis deepens, only then will I think the unity of workers, farmers, unorganized sector come about. At the moment, you know, this is something that we've been talking about since 93, 94, when we did the alternate budget and Sitaram was a member of our group of alternate budget. We've been talking about it. We were talking about alternatives, etc. But that unity could not come about. So even though the, the National Alliance of People's Movement was set up in that February when we did the alternate budget, the trade union confederation was set up, but they have not been able to cooperate with each other. And that's why these haven't gone further. I think it's only when the crisis deepens, and you're absolutely right when you said that why would the capitalists give up? Those who are gaining from it, from the system, they're not going to give up. And therefore, I see the crisis as deepening. The crisis will deepen till the point when the larger forces begin to see that they need to oppose it. So Thank I think you. the trend is downward. You know, we are in supply side economics rather than demand side economics. And supply side economics means giving more to businesses and less to the common people who have lost incomes. Thank you, John. One minute. Uh, um, I, I actually wonder a little bit why this moment of the pandemic this time of the pandemic hasn't provided more of an opportunity. Um, after all, uh, there's been widespread suffering. No, yes. middle class, you know, middle classes, people like us, um, you know, uh, not being able to get oxygen, not being able to find beds in, in, in hospitals, um, massive suffering am amongst poorer people. It would it seem to me this, and, and, and the, the, the failure of, of the, the regime, so, so, so much in sort of plain view, I, I, I would have thought this would have been a moment for actually uh, mobilization, bringing together people across a, a wide spectrum of, of society uh, in opposition to uh, to the to the regime, but of course, um, you know, I, I think in India as uh, elsewhere in the world, you know, politics has become a sort of, in some senses, a, a kind of branch of the entertainment uh, industry, and when you have a regime that has such control over the over the media as as this one, uh, you know, it is it, it, to. to, to Mobilization becomes extraordinarily difficult, but there is a moment here, it seems to me. One, one <laughs> sentence, Harish, one <laughs> sentence before you finish. You're right, absolutely, John. But the point is, these lockdowns, the restrictions of COVID, etc., are applicable to us, while the government can go ahead and do their agenda without any obstruction. There's that a factor also, apart from their, their ability to immediately divert attention from this content to rousing and emotional communal appeal. When you have something, I mean, the discontent rising, bodies on the Ganga, and the total revolt in Uttar Pradesh, you have the Cow Protection Act, you have the, the Population Control Act, new laws brought in, divide the people on that. That is the that that is something that will have to be kept with. And that is where depoliticization is the biggest hurdle. And that is our job, of course, to get back to the people and do it. And we're trying, let's see, let's I mean, at least I'm hopeful. Thank you, Sitaram. Thank you very much. I, uh, my only contention has been with, uh, I mean, we all know that the present regime, um, 
there is very little to say in his favor. But why is that those of us, other forces which seek to speak in the name of the vast majority, have not been able to bring think of think more smartly, uh, yeah. um, uh, being little more clever, little more uh, up to date uh, um, on what they do. I can't grudge my uh, if I'm playing cricket, my um, opponent. Better, uh, I'm betting the bowler is going to bowl very fast ball. Uh, uh, I should be able to handle it, and I should have the enough skills. I had. Uh, you yes. require the resources to have a good bat, good gloves. Yes, that is the point. <laughs> that is the yes, point. Yes. The resources yes. are required for the for meeting this challenge. Yes. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. To, uh, thanks the organizer for everybody. Uh, Nira, thank you for organizing all this. Putting us into it. Thank you very much. I was looking Thanks forward to hearing you, yes. Chandu. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Yes. Bye. Thank you. Bye. For the lovely session. Thank you so much. Thank lovely you. session. Thanks a lot. India has kick started the global forum. Yeah. Great.